Good morning everyone. This week's Toy of the Week is a Mr. Potato Head. And um, Mr. Potato has lots of different parts. See, we have ears and eyes and a mouth, different parts of the body. God talks about the different types parts of the body in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, he talks about how as part of the church, we are all part of Christ's body. Here's what it says. A person's body is only one thing, but it has many parts. Yes, there are many parts to a body, but all those parts make up one body. Christ is like that too. Some of us are Jews, and some of us are Greeks, and some of us are slaves, and some of us are free, but we are all baptized into one body through one spirit, and we were all made to share in the one spirit. And a person's body has more than one part. The foot might say, I am not a hand, so I am not a part of the body. But saying this would not stop the foot from being part of the body. The ear might say, I am not an eye, but I am, so I am not part of the body. But saying this would not make the ear stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, the body would not be able to hear. If the whole body were an ear, the body would not be able to smell anything. If each part of the body were the same part, there would be no body. But truly, God put the parts in the body as he wanted them. He made a place for each one of them. And so there are many parts, but only one body. So in this verse is talking about how each of us is different. Our ear, or I'm different than somebody else, but we're all part of Christ when we're all part of the church in the same way that there are parts of the body. Have a great day. A person's body is one thing, but it has many parts. Yeah, there are many parts to a body, but all those parts make only mm, one body. Christ is like that too, but we were all baptized into one body through one spirit, and we were all made to share in the one spirit. So like we said, a person's body has more than one part. It has many parts. The foot might say, I'm not a hand, so I'm not part of the body. But saying this would not stop the foot from being part of the body. The ear might say, I am not an eye, so I am not part of the body. Saying this would not make the ear stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, the body would not be able to hear. You mean we couldn't hear music or funny jokes? Exactly. And if the whole body were an ear, the body would not be able to smell anything. Wait, wait, wait. You mean like cookies, flowers, nothing? You got it. Nothing. <gasps> if each part of the body were the same part, there would be nobody. God put the parts in the body as he wanted them. He made a place for each one of them. And so there are many parts, but only one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the foot, uh, hey mate, uh, I don't need you. No! Those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are really very, very important. God did not want our body to be divided. God wanted the different parts to care the same for each other. If one part of the body suffers, then all the other parts suffer with it. Or if one part of our body is honored, then all the other parts share its honor. All of you together are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of the body.
Good morning and welcome to the Community Christian Church. If you would, stand and join us while we sing.
When we read about the gospel account, um, the different gospel accounts about the night before Jesus went to the cross, we see the words about the institution of the Lord's Supper. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember what Jesus did for us. For the forgiveness of sins, this is why Jesus did what he did for us. But we also see words that may trouble us, for they certainly troubled his disciples. One of you will betray me. When Jesus revealed that a betrayer was sitting at the table with him, it caused each one of his disciples to consider whether he was capable, you got something to say, of such treachery. One by one, each declared, surely you don't mean me. Each one of them, including Judas, was forced by Jesus' revelation to question his own thoughts and motives regarding the Lord. Jesus made the, made the Lord's Supper not only a time of remembrance, but a time of self-examination. Self-examination isn't about making sure your good deeds outweigh your bad. That's self-justification. It isn't about comparing yourself to your neighbor. That's self-righteousness. Self-examination is a reflection on your relationship with Jesus and whether you are responding appropriately. He is your savior. Are you grateful? He is your Lord. Are you submissive to his rule? 2,000 years ago, Jesus invited 12 men around his table and challenged each one of them to examine their relationship with him. Today, he invites us to do the same. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time each week to stop and remember your sacrifice for us. Help us to reflect on our relationship with you and grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I was preparing for this week, um, we went back and, and looked at some videos uh, that we recorded back, at the, back in March. Uh, we got together as a praise team and wanted to record some songs that we usually did in church and then put those out there and we were looking for songs that brought comfort to people and uh, I don't know about you guys but anytime my life gets turned upside down I always go back to to Jesus and and he is as the Bible says the rock that is the cornerstone that is the foundation of everything that I am and so when I hear this song especially in light of all that's happened in the past six months um, it, it has a new meaning to me and makes even more powerful my faith in, in Jesus the Rock.
Thank you, Dave. Guys, oh, good singing this morning. And I uh, trust all of you are well and doing well. Can I ask, how many of you turned your heat on this morning or last night? Oh, half a dozen or so of you. I got up this morning and uh, turned our heat on. I thought we'd had enough with air conditioning until later today. Mr. Dave, you doing all right with your red shoes? Yes, sir. Okay. I tore them today, though. You tore them? Oh, my. Well, well, Dean will buy a new pair, so <laughs> don't count on it, though. You know Dean. Hey, we're glad to have all of you. Uh, if you have one of these cards on your seat, and you should, uh, this Friday, our missions team is going over to northern Kentucky to work for Master Provision. And in October, uh, we are going to um, uh, be packing here. Uh, we are packing... Uh, on behalf of IDES, International Disaster Emergency Service, that we are paying for like 15,000 meals. We will pack them. And where there are disasters, like in Louisiana and Texas, those meals get sent there. And so uh, because we did that, somebody else ch chipped in, and they're making 5,000 more meals available to us. And so you, you come into our building. I'm not sure if we'll be in this room or the fellowship hall downstairs we will be packing meals, uh, they're dry meals, we will be packing them uh, for approximately five hours from like nine in the morning till two in the afternoon. And uh, so we need um, like 30 people and I'm hoping that many of you can sign up and come and be with us that date in October and look at your calendar and, and it would be a great way to serve uh, uh, lots of other people. We can't all go to Louisiana but there are ways that we can serve. Two weeks from today, we uh, start with uh, children's ministry in the back at our 9.30 only hour, only at 9.30. And uh, we have some guidelines. We'll be publishing all of that. But, uh, you know, just so you know, it's sort of like this service. It's a touchless service, except the kids will be touching, of course. But if you're a volunteer, they'll wear a mask. Uh, they'll, we're asking everybody to wash their hands and sanitize. Uh, there will be a check-in person that will do a thermometer read on you. Like when I, I think the other day I was in several different places. I had my temperature taken four different times. Uh, and uh, so all of that, we will publish that in our Friday e-news for you. But just so you know, two weeks from today, two weeks from today is also Leanne Pierce's last Sunday with us. Uh, Leanne will, uh, uh, no, excuse me, uh, next week. Uh, will be Leanne's last Sunday with us. And so we will have a, a table in the back and a table out in the connection area if you want to make a card or buy a card and say something and leave that card for Leanne. Uh, we, we will certainly miss her in the office. If you volunteered and helped last weekend, uh, we owe you a great deal of thanks. And uh, also, I saw Don jump walk in. Don, where are you hiding out there? There's Don. Can you stand up, Don? I want to introduce you to Don, who's kind of shy. I, Don was, I baptized Don Tuesday night, and so Don is our newest member here at Community. And Don, welcome to the church family. I, uh, I saw his text later on. He told, he's in a Bible study group, and I happened to be on that text link, and it said, Dan dunked me tonight. So, um, 
but we're, we're glad to have Don be a part of our church family. Uh, as you know, there's been all kinds of health things that have gone on. Uh, many of you have asked me about Kay. Kay's doing well. I left her at home this morning. Her sister Angela is sitting with her. She came home from the hospital yesterday doing so well that they, they offered her to come home Friday. And she said, no, I think I'll stay in the hospital another day. And she did. Talk, Danny Hayes had triple bypass. And Dan uh, called me last night and said he was doing well. He and Debbie are doing fine. Uh, and that's kind of a small miracle. I don't know if you know when they do open chest surgery that if the heart is ideally located, they don't have to break the sternum. They can go between the ribs. And Dan was able to have a triple bypass with no breaking of the sternum. They, they went right through his ribs. So that was a, a kind of a small miracle, and we praise God for that. Um, Super George, I talked to Shirley the other night. She is doing well. On, on a sad end, I was called to a nursing home on Friday. Um, Sue Gregory, many of you know Sue Gregory. Um, she uh, has cancer and uh, they were calling the family in on Friday. I did not hear anything yesterday. And I'm wondering, is, is Jean Rose here this morning? Her son, Mark, Mark is her oldest son. Mark had a massive stroke on Tuesday and uh, died Thursday evening. I do not have funeral details. I talked to, I talked to Jean on Friday and don't confuse her oldest son, Mark, with Larry, who, her other son, who brings her. Two different people, two different people. And so uh, Mark and his wife, Lisa. Lisa teaches school, I believe, in Bethel. And uh, they've been very active with Empower Youth. So nice, nice people. Dana, it's good to see Dana Wiedemeyer, who's back after surgery to walk in today. So I'm telling you, we've had the walking health concerns around our church and there's more that I have forgotten but let me pray father there are many people who uh, look to you for help and encouragement Lord we all realize that at times in our life we can't do things on our own that we need the help of people that are close to us and people that we care for and father we're glad that many respond we don't even have to ask they just show up they do all kinds of things for us but most of all, they care for us and they love us and uh, they offer encouragement to us. Lord, we thank you for the church. Your son came to this world to bind the evil one. And Lord, he did that. He's chained to a certain degree. And Father, in this time that we have, help us, Father, to flex our church muscles to be of an encouragement to other people. We thank you for people who use their gifts and their talents to serve. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who served us best through the gift of eternal life that he bought for us at Calvary. And Lord, you demonstrated your great dynamo of power by resurrecting him. And when Mary Magdalene ran to the apostles to tell them that he's alive, Father, it was the greatest news this world's ever heard because one who had died lived again. And Lord, that's our fate too, because we believe and have accepted your son. We, even though we may die physically, we will live forever in your heaven. We thank you for that gift and that hope. Lord, we thank you for your church, your kingdom here on the earth. And Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. There were two women, both known by their, their uh, names, of course, their first names. They were both... Uh, alive and they happened to die the very same week seven days apart but what's interesting is that when each died though those two women were totally different the world mourned but that's where many of the similarities between them end one woman had wealth and an empire and the other lady simply owned nothing one was a Headliner for the rich and the famous and the paparazzi followed her every moment. They spent uh, much time reporting and telling about her while the other woman spent her time among the poor, ministering to the needs of those who had no one to care for them. One had a life filled with turmoil and unrest and the other possessed the 
same peace that you have, a peace that passes understanding. One was on a continual search for purpose and meaning in her life, while the other one had found purpose and meaning for her life, and she proved it and demonstrated it by living it out on a daily basis. One was famous, but probably in the years to come will be forgotten, while the other was famous long before her death and will be remembered, I believe, through the centuries by the saints here upon the earth. Many people envied the one. They followed her hairstyle and her wardrobe. They envied her popularity, her power, her opulent lifestyle. But it never made sense to the majority of us that she could never find happiness in life. And you know, when you think about it, the one had it all. Everything that the press and Hollywood wants us to believe about how you're supposed to live your life, to be happy, to live a life of significance. But she never achieved happiness, though she searched the entire world over for it. Few of us will have chosen the life, though, of the other woman. Her life was marked by labor and sacrifice, and need I say her robes were not fashionable. No one was longing to live her type of a lifestyle. And yet her life was filled with purpose and meaning far more than the first woman. Could it be that in this life that we most long for and desire is not really what we're really seeking after all? It's not some fairy tale princess type of a story, but it's found in the life of a little old woman, a little old woman who would walk the streets of Calcutta seeking to minister to those in need. Those two women, you know them well. The first woman that I talked about, the rich and the opulent lifestyle, that was who? Princess Diana, right? And the other woman, you know her, she's died recently too. Her name is Mother Teresa. And so today we start a new series with the most unimpressive title, Serving Lessons. But it might just simply be the type of a series that you are looking for because you too might be on a quest or a search you might want to live the happy type of a life. Now, the people in Jesus' day, when they heard about the type of a lifestyle that Jesus was talking about, it did not impress them the way that he lived his life. His type of a life was a difficult life. It's one that was marked by hardship and sacrifice. And yet it comes with a great reward because all of us, when we die, we want to live with an eternal reward in heaven. But you'll never find, you'll never find that lifestyle by seeking to please yourself. Jesus was doing what Jesus did. He was working the miracles, helping people, speaking to hundreds of people. And yet he seemed to always have time to deal with people one person at a time. No matter how tired or worn out he was, Jesus had time for people. The scriptures tell us that Jesus called 12 men, 12 disciples, to be sort of like an inner circle. And those were the men that Jesus would spend his time with. Men he would pour himself into so that when he left our planet, so that when Jesus returned to the Heavenly Father, those 12 men would carry on the ministry and impact and bring change to a world that had been left in darkness by the evil one. One day, their small group was heading to a town in Galilee called Capernaum. And we really don't know who was walking side by side and saying and telling what stories, what it was. But a dispute arose among the 12 disciples. And the 12 got into this argument about who would be the greatest. Now, who would be on the fast track to succeed Jesus as leader one day? Who would sit on his left hand and his right hand of power? There was Peter... Peter could say, hey, you remember up on the Mount of Transfiguration, I'm the guy that said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I ought to be top dog. There was Andrew who said, little brother, get out of the way. I'm the guy that brought you to Jesus. Matthew could say, hey, I'm the poster child. I was the sinner. I was the tax collector. I ought to be top dog. And there was John who just simply said, he loves me best. They all had their argument. Each one probably had some reason that they thought their case made them number one to be promoted over the rest. 
But here's what's really going on. These 12 men had heard the message. These 12 men knew what it was like to be around Jesus for nearly three years now. But they didn't get it and they didn't understand it. All they simply wanted was to live a life of significance and success in the eyes of our world. Jesus, they thought, was the key to that sort of a life. But they had missed. They had missed how this successful and significant life would happen. Jesus, though, enters into their conversation. Beginning in Mark 9, 33, it says, After they arrived at Capernaum and settled in a house, Jesus asked his disciples, What were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer because they had been arguing about which one of them would be the greatest. He sat down and he called the 12 disciples over to him. And you can almost envision that, him saying, hey guys, grab a chair and come on, pull in a little bit closer. He sat down and he called the 12 and he said, whoever wants to be first, first, must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. Now you you would think that those words, emphatic words like that from Jesus, Whoever wants to be top dog has to bring up the rear. You would think, wow, I don't get that. And you know what? They didn't. The subject surfaces again in the very next chapter of Mark. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 35. James and John, they approach Jesus and they say, Jesus, we want to ask you a favor. When you come into your kingdom... We'd like to sit on your hand. One of us on the left, one on the right. Could, could, could you work that out for us? Because you like us best, right? Jesus, I think, thought, you two yahoos, you have no idea of what you're asking. Verse 41, Mark writes, When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and he said, you know the rulers, the rulers lord it over the people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever, whoever wants to be a leader among you, you must first be a servant. And whoever wants to be first among you, you must be a, here's the in, unpopular S word, must be a slave to everyone else. For even the Son of Man... By the way, our our men's group on Tuesday night had been studying Daniel. We've just left Daniel. That's the title that Jesus preferred to call himself. It means Messiah. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear the word serve, I have a bunch of thoughts that run through my mind. I will bet... Some of us wouldn't think of service and slave and servitude as making an impact and certainly not leading to the greatest life that ever lived. But the greatest life that ever was lived was the life of Christ, and he certainly made an impact. Have you ever stopped to think that Jesus Jesus was so great simply because he served? Servanthood marks the life of Jesus, and he wanted servanthood to mark the life of people like you and me this morning. We got up this morning, and Kay, uh, at our home, the dog wanted out at like 5.30. Alarm wasn't set till 6, but after three attempts, the dog got me out. And when I went out, Kay was sleeping, uh, reclining on the couch. She goes back, you know. And uh, Kay said... I've been, it's okay, I woke up about 4.30, I'm, I'm awake. I said, well, Attila wants out. She said, when you get Attila out, could you? And she had about three requests for me at about quarter to six this morning. Now, I know you all think that I'm a kind, loving husband. Uh, what? But I thought, I'm not even out of bed a minute. And she wants something. And I gave it to her. True greatness doesn't come with possessions or money. True 
true greatness doesn't come because of our fame or being at the top of a corporate ladder or the athletic field or the political world. Hey, I want to tell you, true greatness comes with sacrifice. True greatness comes with surrender. True greatness comes with humility and the death of self-centeredness. As I look around the world and I look at the character of a lot of people that I see on the TV news these days, I wonder what has happened to our world. And I think of people that have made a lasting impact like your Savior and my Savior, the Apostle Paul. I think of people like Mother Teresa. You know, we are so hung up on getting our own rights and our own way that we don't realize how far we have strayed from the pathway that Jesus taught us about. We have a me and my mentality many times. Many of us, we feel like we're entitled. It's my right. It's my privilege. I'm entitled. So someone take care of me and serve me. And that's why the commercial world is full of, you deserve a break today. Have it your way. And you know, I think if Jesus were here today, he would tell you, all of that stuff, it's a lie. It's a lie. That's not how you make an impact. That's not how you make a difference in our world today. Those phrases are the exact opposite of what you and I are searching for. Because you and I are searching for significance. And the way that happens is by being the servant to others. There's a man that I've told you about several different times in sermons. His name is Barnabas. Quickly, let me recount the three occasions that we meet him. First of all, we meet him in chapter 4. 4.32 4.32 of Acts says all the believers were of one heart and mind. Isn't it great when you're a part of a church and the church has one heart and one mind? I mean, I felt that last Sunday, standing out on the property, um, standing up there on, in the tent, that, that was just truly great. All the believers are, were of one heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord. Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them. You skip down to verse 36. Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, he sold a field he owned and he brought the money to the apostles. You know, that's a picture of God working through his people, the church. We've been in this pandemic for about six months now. And when we went into the pandemic, I can tell you that one of the things that we were fearful about was our money situation in our church. Yeah, we had just paid off the property, but how would we survive not meeting together? And you guys have been so wonderful. Your your gifts and tithes and offerings, you've exceeded our budget this year. Don't quit. I'm just saying, you've been so wonderful. Our missionaries have been paid. Our staff has been paid. One of these days we'll figure out how to get the heat on, but it's all, it's good. Thank you. It's a picture of God's church working together where people are excited. When they see other people and they they have a heart for other people, they're excited when someone is baptized into Christ. When they see people coming and growing in their faith, there's this deep sense of community that fills the hearts of God's people. This was a young church in the book of Acts. It was a time of great anxiety. There was persecution. How would they handle it? What would their leaders do? How would their leaders lead? How would it all happen? I thought of it last week, being out on the property again. I stood there and I looked at the property. I looked at what we've done thus far. And I thought, we're going to need a lot of people in the days to come that will step up and help. In the early church, the one man that stepped up right away that we see was this man by the name of Barnabas. He steps out of the crowd to serve other people that are in need. You know the story. He sold a piece of land. He brought the money and he gave the money to the apostles. And he saw a need. There was a need to feed the widow ladies. And he brought money and he said, do something with this. 
You know, what Barnabas did wasn't normal. Most people see a problem, and what do they do? Dean, I'm going to pick on you. We're driving down the road yesterday. Dean says, Dad, our windshield needs washing, you know. I said, Dean, when we get to the gas station, you can wash the windshield. We see problems, and many of us, we like to complain about the problems. We like to tell other people about the problems. We hope someone else will do something about the problem. Barnabas didn't complain. He didn't go gripe. True servants do what they need to do. He addressed the problem. His actions earned him the name son of encouragement from the apostles. And others in the church began to follow his example. We see Barnabas again in chapter 9 of the book of Acts. He comes to the aid of a man by the name of Saul. You know him as the apostle Paul. Saul had gone to the priest. He'd gotten letters to arrest Christians and followers of Christ. He's on the road to Damascus, and you remember Jesus spoke with him. And a short time later, it was Saul who would give his life to Christ. However, most all of the other believers were simply afraid of him. They said, you know, that guy's just trying to infiltrate our church. They were thinking that he was using his baptism and his coming to Christ as a guise to simply gain information about who was and who wasn't a believer. 926 of Acts says, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were afraid of him. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus at Damascus. Barnabas risked his reputation to help Saul to enter into the fellowship of the church. Barnabas must have trusted Saul. I don't know if the Holy Spirit motivated and prompted him. I have no idea. But in a sense, Barnabas was gambling his reputation by trusting in Saul. And what, what an impact the Apostle Paul would make in the years to come. But it wouldn't have happened if there had not been a Barnabas. It was a selfless act that Barnabas brought Saul to the apostles. And then last we see that Barnabas appears again in chapter 11. Evidently some early Christians were leading people when the church scattered through persecution. Some Christians had gone to a city called Antioch. And these believers there began to spread the news about Christ. And people began coming to the Lord and news arrived in Jerusalem. So the apostles at Jerusalem, when they heard that there were large numbers of people coming to Jesus at Antioch, they said, there's nobody up there to teach them. We need a teacher to go. So they sent Barnabas. Verse 23 of chapter 11 says, when he arrived, he saw the evidence of God's blessing. He was filled, that was Barnabas, was filled with joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas, the Bible says, was a good man. You're a good man or a good woman, right? Full of the Holy Spirit, strong in the faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. You know, it was at Antioch that the Christians were first called Christians. Christian simply means little Christ. So here's Barnabas. How's that apply to you? Here you are, 30, 45 years of age, but one day you're going to be an older man. You're going to be 70 or 80 years of age, man or woman, and you're going to look back across your life, and odds are you're going to look in the mirror and you're going to ask yourself, what impact did I have? in my lifetime for my Savior. And people, this is the time, this is the time that we get to enroll in the school of life management taught by Jesus in the Scriptures, where you learn to be more concerned about giving to others, where you learn to be more concerned about giving than getting, where you learn how to promote the welfare of others so that they succeed and climb the ladder and you Take a back seat where you learn how to do for others and not promote yourself. God took what Barnabas had to offer 
and what Barnabas brought to the table, and God multiplied it over and over again so that the early church was blessed. What about us today when we look into our mirror? Do you look into a mirror and think that you know servants and you can picture them in your mind's eye? Or when you look in that mirror, do you see someone who is a servant? Someone who leads by example. Someone with a genuine, authentic, transparent spirit. Is that your reflection? Or are you thinking of someone else? Jesus called the twelve to lead the church, to motivate the church, to encourage the church, to teach the church, because people are important to our Lord. And without a relationship with Jesus, people will go to hell. That's the stark truth. And Jesus calls on us in 2020 to use the gifts, whatever they are, that you possess to make a difference in the life of other people. Are you seeing a servant with a heart like Mother Teresa when you look in the mirror? Or are you seeing someone who's living a life Maybe like Diana, without purpose, wondering when life is going to make sense. I hope this morning that your life makes sense, that you found your purpose, and that your purpose is promoting Christ to each and every one around you. Let me pray. God, we thank you for your church. Father, as we begin this series about making servant leadership, as we begin thinking about ourselves, Father, help us to make an impact. Father, it was so good to see Jody stand here, to listen to her give a wonderful communion meditation, and to see a young one in her arms. And Father, to know that there's a young gal who will pass on the values and the character of Christ's likeness to her child. Father, help us. We don't know whether our kids will grow up to love you, but Father, help us to pass on to the next generation and the people around us the values and the character of Christ. Help us to be difference makers by the way we live our lives. God, thank you for a loving church, a kind and responsive people. God, none of us are perfect. We all stand in need of grace. Lord, help us as we seek to touch our community for the cause of Christ and your church and your kingdom here on the earth. Father, we love you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you all. We are dismissed.